Hey folks, we're just giving a few moments here at the top for Zoom to let everybody in before we get started here. If you are already in tonight's uh, webinar with us, you can open up your chat window and find some information about how to purchase books by tonight's featured authors. Good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Chelsea from Greenlight, and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Julian Rubenstein presenting his new book, The Holly, Five Bullets, One Gun, and the Struggle to Save an American Neighborhood. He'll be talking with Alan Chen, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just wanna say a huge thanks to Julian, Alan, and the team at FSG for making this happen and to all of you for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Now, just a few housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they cannot see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and there are a couple different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. That's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. And importantly, tonight's featured book, The Holly, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person in our bookstore locations, noon to 7 p.m. every day of the week. And you can purchase Julian's book and many others on site. Or order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. I'll drop that by link in the chat. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, Buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Our interviewer tonight is Alan Chen. He was born and raised in New York City's Chinatown. Since 1996, he has worked as a freelance photojournalist reporting for the New York Times and other publications from China, the former Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, Egypt, Iraq, Central Asia, and Ukraine, as well as extensively in the United States. Alan is also managing director of Facing Change, documenting America slash documenting Detroit, a community-based photojournalism initiative and a winner of the 2017 Knight Foundation Detroit Arts Challenge, 2019 and 2020 National Endowment for the Arts in EA grants. Additionally, Alan is both writing and photographing a book on his ancestral region in Southern China and a founding partner of Jet Age Books a small press specializing in photography books. His images are in the permanent collections of the Museum of Modern Art in New York City and the Detroit Institute of Art. He'll be speaking with our featured author, Julian Rubenstein. He is a journalist and the author of Ballad of the Whiskey Robber, which was a finalist for the Edgar Allan Poe Best Fact Crime Award. His work has appeared in The New Yorker, Rolling Stone, and The New York Times Magazine, as well as in Best American Crime Writing. His new book is The Holly, Five Bullets, One Gun, and the Struggle to Save an American Neighborhood. He lives in Denver. 
The Holly is a multi-generational crime story that explores the porous boundaries between a city's elites and its most disadvantaged citizens, as well as the fraught interactions of police, confidential informants, activists, gang members, and ex-gang members trying or not to put their past behind them. In a time of national reckoning over race, policing, and the uses and abuses of power, Lupinstein offers a dramatic and humane illumination of what's at stake. The book has received starred reviews in Publishers Weekly, Kirkus Reviews, and Booklist, which calls The Holly a gripping deep dive into media underreporting and too quick judgment, and most shockingly into how the criminal justice industrial complex may be invested in systemic corruption designed to keep drug wars going, dramatic and wrenching. Julian is going to start us off with a reading from the book, and then he'll be talking with Alan and with all of you. Julian, please take it away. Thank you, <clears throat> Chelsea, and uh, thanks to Greenlight Bookstore. I, uh, I miss it there. I lived for a long time in Brooklyn. In fact, I lived in the apartment you see behind Alan Chin right now in Red Hook. Um, and uh, in any case, I uh, will just do a short reading. Um, it's great to be uh, here and talking to, I assume some people who are in New York and, and wherever you are though. Um, but I'm now actually left New York and I am now living in Denver uh, in order to do this story seven years ago uh, when I started it. I didn't know that I would move back to Denver where I grew up, but it, that's what it, ended up taking um, to do this. Uh, and this particular, I'll just read a short uh, bit and then we'll have a more, uh, you know, engaging conversation as well. Uh, but this is, uh, the book is called The Holly and um, it, it uh, The Holly is, a, is a, a place that it was also a shopping center uh, in the center of this uh, neighborhood in uh, Northeast Denver, about three and a half miles from uh, no, about five miles rather from uh, downtown Denver. And um, it, it's sort of been a, really a central hub of this community for a long time. And this community was also the first um, uh, neighborhood, well, the second actually like African-American neighborhood in Denver, but the first that was called out to be a purposeful in, uh, experiment in, in integration. And the, the community quickly became um, uh, it was a it was a real case of white flight, and um, it had become almost all black uh, within a, within a decade. Um, and uh, as it went through the years, um, it went on to not only be uh, the center of Denver civil rights movement, where a police shooting in 1968 had kicked this act, uh, activism and protests and demands off, um, and then later. Uh, another tragic turn for it was when it became into in the mid 1980s, late 1980s, the first headquarters of, the, of Denver's first blood gang. And that gang had started, uh, sure enough, as a rival to the Crips gang, which was in five points. But of course, there were gangs in Denver and these neighborhoods were rivals even before that. And the book goes into looking at that. But why, for example, the two most historic African-American communities in Denver turned their arms against each other and went to war and are still at war. Um, but at, on this particular, uh, in this section, it's a really pivotal, just short few pages, but when the main character, Terrence Roberts, who was a blood, uh, who became a blood, and his father uh, ended up, had, had been close with um, founder of the Crips, whose name was Michael Asbury. And uh, so this is when just one pivotal night for both this Michael Asbury and, and the Holly Shopping Center at, at the end of the first act of the book. Um, uh, George Roberts was asleep when his phone started blowing up. This was how he was awakened a few times a week by calls or texts. Usually it meant someone had been shot. The spirit world, so he believed, was with him in these moments. He was a, he actually had been a gangster and became a preacher. Still, George was unprepared for the news this day. The, leg the legendary Crip founder, Michael Asbury, was dead. 
George had just seen him. Call me Brother Michael, he'd told George. He was carrying the Bible George had given to him, but, the, but his sadness was apparent. George kneeled, knelt to pray, but the tears came, only briefly. There was work to do. He got dressed. The address he'd been given, a townhouse complex off Colfax in Aurora, was one he knew well. A former girlfriend had lived next door. It was also where Mike's older sister, Star, was living. It was about 9 a.m. when George arrived. A dozen police cruisers and squad cars were parked around the complex. Yellow police tape surrounded one of the homes. Clusters of young men and women huddled together outside it, hugging and sobbing. George spotted some of Mike's family. Hubert, one of Mike's older brothers, was wheezing loudly and clutching Star. They all knew Uncle Georgie. He made, and he made his way over. Few in Invisible Denver had more access to the word on the street than George. Over the next hour, he learned what had happened. Sometime after midnight, Star was looking to score some dope from a, from a neighbor. She didn't have any money, so she struck a deal to put up her television as collateral. But she realized she'd been taken. The stuff was woo or fake crack. Star called Mike, who was only a few blocks away at Wolf's a motel and dive bar on Colfax. He got to Star's place around 3.30 a.m. and soon was inside the dealer's apartment. They were two young African-Americans. Mike didn't know them, and it, and it didn't seem that they knew him. Mike took the first swing, hitting one of the guys in the face. He turned to the other, who had a gun. Mike swiped at it, but two shots came, hitting him in the torso. The dealers ran. Star rushed in. I can't breathe, Mike said to her. An ambulance arrived, but by the time it reached the hospital, Mike was dead. George saw people were streaming toward the area. The crowd was growing well beyond its usual size. Dozens of Crips wearing blue bandanas and shirts stood in the street, blocking, blocking traffic and banging on windshields. Whether Asbury was still running Denver's Crips didn't matter. He would always be the founder and the, and the king. Now the king was dead. George knew as well as anyone, vengeance was coming. Some of the police officers who knew George from the funerals they patrolled asked for his help clearing the street. Anyone who's a code five, we're arresting them, they told him. Code five meant people with warrants. George called his boss at the airport and told him he wouldn't be able to come in. He waded into the groups of familiar and unfamiliar faces. Code five, he said, code five. Before dawn the, the following morning, Terrence, Terrence's phone awoke him. Something was going on with the Holly. He pulled on some clothes and got in the car. When he got close, the streets were blocked by fire trucks and police vehicles. He got out smelling smoke and walked toward the shopping center. It was engulfed in flames. From the roof over the liquor store to the family dollar in the middle of the center, flames lashed 40 feet into the night sky. Neighbor re neighborhood residents began to gather, some in pajamas, as firefighters on ladders high above the shopping center blasted water onto it from thick hoses. When, the, when daylight broke, when daylight began to break and the fire was still not out, the extent of the damage became visible. The, building, the building's roof had collapsed, leaving only naked steel beams. Store windows and doors were shattered, revealing wiring and the burning remains of products and shelving. After more than half a century, the Holly Shopping Center was gone. Um, so that's just a little, that, that's the end of act one and the Holly Shop, that's the, that, that basically ends this huge era of the Holly Shopping Center and it kicks off ultimately the redevelopment of Holly Square, which is, uh, which I'm sure we could talk about, you know, is definitely at the center of this book because as much as it is a book that is about um, policing and criminal justice, I think an interesting thing is that it's also about um, development in a lot of ways of cities, urban development. But in any case, that's a small reading and I'll throw it over to our moderator, Alan Chin. Thank you, Julian, for that reading. Very gripping scene, um, indeed. Um, 
I guess my first question is going to be, and, and you talked about having lived in Brooklyn and New York for a long time and moving back to Denver where you grew up. Just very briefly, tell us how and why did you move back to Denver and how and why you met Terrence, who is the main character of your book, the former blood um, you know, gang, not just member, but really gang leader. Um, who renounces all that and, and really becomes a community activist um, and, uh, you know, very successful one, at least for a yeah. time. So, so how, how'd you get back to Denver? Why, why are you staying there? And, and how, how and why did you meet Terrence? Um, <clears throat> so, right, I grew up in, uh, uh, in South Denver uh, in the 70s and 80s when it was a very different place. And uh, I had heard about the Holly, but only in these sort of like I had just an impression of it as this dangerous place or whatever and um I'd never been I'd driven past it on the way to the airport um and I left Denver I spent most of uh 20 years in New York City um and there I was reading in the New York Times one day about a shooting at Holly Square that involved this former gang member leader and um who had become a high, high profile uh, activist and anti-gang activist who was working there in holly square and he shot a gang member at his own peace rally so it was just a lot of questions and this whole uh i guess i started just looking into you know first online and and gleaning at least that this was also the center of this redevelopment and denver was on, in this kind of high octane period of kind of real estate you know you know strata and uh and and population boom and economy boom and and all of it and gentrification happening and this was actually going on and so it, there was a lot of intrigue in it just from the start for me and i did try to reach out and i successfully reached terence roberts who was at that time um out on bond awaiting uh, trial or the resolution of his case and he was facing attempted murder. How did you, I mean, how did you even get his number though? Because here you are, you're, you're well, a his, white uh, guy. Yeah, well, you know. You're a white uh, guy. You're a white guy who's lived uh, you know, in New York. You, you right. haven't lived in Denver for a long time. Like you're saying, you didn't know the neighborhood really yeah. at all when, yeah. when you were growing up there. So yeah, I mean, but um, first all I got, first I reached him online by email Terrence Roberts loves life at yahoo.com was his email. And, uh, you know, I found it because of his, yeah, because of his, uh, uh, he had a, he had this organization that had a, had a, had a website, a, sm a small one. Um, but anyway, uh, fortunately it was still up. It was, it was soon down, you know, the, his organization ended up in basically being turned over and he had resigned, but yeah, I finally, I met him and, you know, from the beginning, the things that he said to me were super, intriguing as well he he clearly had a different story about than what was in the media about what happened uh what was in the media was this idea that he had tr fallen back into gang life basically and and kind of flown off the handle and maybe shot someone um but they're not only him but as i eventually met people and yes i'll get into the challenge of that uh, but basically there was just a lot of question anyway about what really happened. And then, and then it real, I started to realize that I had a very big story on my hand basically. And, and, you know, and so once I started realizing that, and, and because as you know, the book ultimately is, you know, in order to kind of start answering this sort of mystery story to me, this not a who done it, but a why done it. We know who pulled the trigger. Why is the question. Uh, I had to basically go back 50, 60 years into the civil rights movement and trace this kind of like path to how we got to this moment, even to construct like what happened. And so that's what I did. And along the way, I also, as things were happening in real time, quite a story was unfolding in real time while I was there. Um, so yeah, this, this actually comes to Tom Vogel here, has already typed in the question. Julian, how nice. did you... How did you come upon this story, which I think you just answered? Uh, but interestingly, he also asked, how did the writing and reporting compare with the ballad uh, of the whiskey robber, right? Because as, well, and, yeah. and for, let me just, for those who don't know, that's Julian's first book. Um, and it is a very funny book, actually, about a whiskey robber, a, a guy who, who liked to, to have a few drinks first before 
hitting up um, the local banks in, in Budapest, Hungary. And, you know, it has serious elements, but it's a very funny book. Um, and you're known for some pretty funny pieces. This, at least on the surface, is not a funny story. True. Um, it's, uh, you know, so, so basically what drew me into it was the fact that I would, it was, I'd never done a story in Denver. I'm, fr I'm from Denver. I grew up in Denver where I, I ended up, I'm now here again, like living here. Um, and, and I knew it was a good story and it was something that was like really had a lot of meat on it, like in terms of so many things. So yeah, even though I've written <clears throat> these funny pieces, I think, you know, also the whiskey robber, I mean, the themes behind it, I mean, the re the, how he became, how he became a bank robber and how, and what he ended up kind of symbolizing in post-communist Eastern Europe was what drew that, drew me to that. You know, I, I'm not just gonna, the, the thing is, as anyone who remembers that book knows, is it was a long time ago, like longer than I would even, even like to think ago. But the point is that I have a really high bar, you know, to do a book. It's a damn lot of work. And um, that was an incredible story. And I could honestly start to get a sense that this one, you know, just had a lot to it. Great characters, great storyline, high suspense, and all of these other issues that actually, frankly, they got bigger and bigger and bigger the deeper I went. They really at, the, at, the, at the basic level, though, how did you get Terrence, you know, um, and all these other um, people that did end up speaking to you, right? Some of them taking some risk to do so. Um, you know, to, to a white guy, you know, yeah. a, a white yeah. guy who, yeah, yeah, totally, yeah, like, yeah. like, you know, you're, and, and even though you are from there, you know, you're certainly not from the neighborhood and you certainly no. hadn't lived in the neighborhood and, you know, what, what made them trust you? How'd you, how'd you, you know, how were you able to not just win their trust, but, but to actually hang out for seven years? Yeah. Well, this is where, I mean, maybe he can, I don't know if he's had a chance to get back to what get back or watching or anything, or maybe if you're listening, Terrence, you can run over here and come in for the end. But uh, he can, of course, in terms of why they came to trust me, I've heard some of them speak about that. So they, of course, they're better to answer that question than me. But I, um, you know, it was a real challenge, of course. Uh, the first, I, I remember being stood up by a lot of people who said they were going to meet me here for an interview and not showing up. Um, and that went on for a while at the, at the beginning. But then I ended up getting... Um, getting uh uh enough people uh who did trust me basically i just kept showing up showing i cared um you know like understanding what was going on in, in a way that like they were as you remember in the book i mean a lot of people started when things were happening they were all texting me like they sort of saw me as a hope to tell the story because the story had been so mistold and miscovered you know i wish that um I, that that because there were had people who said, well, why am I doing the story? I mean, I, it would be great if if there were African American journalists out there trying to do the story. I mean, the story was so badly miscovered in the Denver media um, that became actually part of the story. I didn't think it was going to be, or no, it would. Um, but uh, uh, so anyway, I, fortunately for me, the people ultimately whose trust I gained trusted me. Not I didn't mind. Not only didn't mind that I was an outsider but also said um, that some of them said to me that actually being white might've been an advantage because the level of mistrust among black men in the community is unfortunately so high. And part of that is because of the, uh, the, the vol volume over the decades of, of informants. You don't know who your, if your friend is who they say you are, if, if your relative even, um, so there are people who, there are a lot of, there's a lot of mistrust in the black community. And I guess that might've served me in terms of being less likely to have some weird ulterior motive that might not be. Uh, okay. And, and we have our surprise special guest, Terrence <laughs> Roberts himself. Yes, um, who is. indeed maybe can shed a little light on that. And I think, um, you know, Terrence is the main character of this book. And, and as we, we've already introduced him in a way. So Terrence, I'll, I'll let you take over for, for a minute. Okay, what would you like me to answer? 
I guess, yeah, oh. that's the first question, you know, of, oh, of, you might of have missed how the did question, you but... and, uh, yeah, the question is, is how did, how did you come to trust Julian, you know, who after all is, is, you know, this, this white man um, who's not from the neighborhood, even though he is from Denver, but certainly not from the neighborhood and, and not somebody you knew before or anyone you knew, knew before. Um, yeah. How'd you come to trust him and talk to him and, and let him hang out for seven years? And make this book. Well, when when he contacted me, I was having to be going through my emails, and I was getting literally hundreds of emails from journalists from all over the place, and I was just deleting them, deleting them, deleting them. A couple <laughs> I was, a couple I of them I was that, reading through. Yeah, a couple of them I was reading through, and it wasn't just journalists. It was some people saying they were journalists, they were not. Some people were journalists. Just all kind of people, family. Um, and now some people I was clicking through, some people I weren't. Um, and then when I seen his name, I clicked on it and, you know, he was like, Hey, I read about this in the New York times. I'm a journalist. I've written this book and, um, he explained who he was. Then I, I Googled him and I looked him up and I seen that he was an experienced journalist, you know, and I was getting, I mean, I was literally just getting ran through the mud here with the local media. Cause the local press here were literally letting the same gang members who I was having issues with, who I had to defend my life against. They were literally letting them get into the Denver Post and call me a terrible person. Um, so I needed somebody to tell my story to. And, and it, it's not like he came to do the book just for me or on me, but I didn't mind that. As long as he was going to have an impartial ear, that's what I needed. And Absolutely. Uh, once he assured me of that, uh, I'm not ashamed of anything. I'm not a perfect person, but I don't, there was nothing I needed to hide from him. I, I didn't need to hide any emails from him. I didn't need to hide any video from him. Um, I really felt that there was a plot against me to push me out. Uh, I definitely could not tell the Denver Post. I definitely could not call the police. And uh, Julian was like my last hope, to be honest with you. So uh, yeah. it's almost like I had to trust him. So um, coming off on that, and I asked this for both of you guys, to Julian and, and Terrence, you know, so Terrence, you did run this um, and start this very small nonprofit called um, Prodigal Son, right? And and you were, um, you know, working really on the ground, right? Working with gang members and former gang members and neighborhood residents and, and really everyone around there to try to reduce, not just reduce the violence, which you were doing um, pretty successfully, but also try to get some economic um you know, jobs and, 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 and development and education and, and all those things and um, into the neighborhood. And, you know, something that was just mentioned in the introduction here, you know, there's a, there's a criminal justice industrial complex, right? Of, and you just mentioned it with the informants and how, you know, people that might still be active gang members are, 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 are um, you know, they become informants and even get paid. Um, you know, in all these ways, uh, both officially and unofficially, right? But there's also a kind of nonprofit industrial complex, I think, too, right? Where a small group um, like you were running, uh, you know, you had to try to get grants from these much bigger, you know, both government and also foundations and, you know, people with millions and millions of dollars, and they're willing to give you maybe a tiny bit of it. Julian, I'll ask you first, and then we'll turn it over to Terrence. How how did that impact this this whole story, right? You know, of of the larger uh, nonprofits and 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 foundations and and you know all those forces at play in Denver. How how did that impact this the Holly? I would say hugely. <laughs> I would say it was such a huge thing. And you know, we, you and I were talking about it the other day. Um, it's it, it's one of those problems that you know it feels like there should be a way to solve in a way, but it's actually very trickier than you think. But like ultimately, of course, in, in a lot of cities and in New York has it too, um, where you have these incredibly powerful and, and wealthy institutional kind of foundations, many of whom are sort of often in step with like other big sort of mainstream political interests, I guess, broadly speaking in a way, right? Or or that are kind of strategically aligned, right? And they, they form ultimately this huge power structure. And you correctly, I think, interestingly call it its own industrial complex. Because 
it, that's what it is. And, and it's like, it becomes very hard to go against it. Or, and ultimately, even these, <clears throat> though these organizations, certainly in, you know, in this uh, book, what we're seeing is um, a, a perfect example of that in which there were like, the Holly Square became a place in which many of the most powerful organizations in Denver and powerful and wealthy people in Denver all became involved. I mean, the billionaire Philip, Philip Anschutz, uh, the city of Denver, it, he, he's now the, the, the main stakeholder. <laughs> in the, I mean, you wouldn't expect him necessarily to be the main stakeholder in this community, I guess, I mean, from his background, but anyway, that this is what they're involved in, the Denver, the city of Denver, the, the Denver Foundation, which is one of these Uber organizations with, you know, I, I don't know, half a billion dollars in, you know, that they're sitting on or whatever, it is something along those lines. And they're often, you know, doing stuff strategically with Denver. And in this case, what happened too, is that those organizations were also not only working on the redevelopment project, but they were also helping fund the um, Project Safe Neighborhoods grant, which is a DOJ federal law enforcement grant. And this kind of, so there's a lot of crossover between the development and the law enforcement. So all of these people are involved and I'll start to be throwing it over to Terrence, but let's just say that Terrence <laughs> is a third generation resident of the community who had been through this dramatic turnaround and it had proven to have, it, a really unbelievably great success helping reduce gang violence in Denver um, through this Colorado Camel movement he started through the organization and the work he was doing on the ground there and it was it was hard too because you know he's set up shop in the headquarters of the Bloods okay so like so, it, so Terrence yeah so let, let me turn so it over to Terrence yeah, so let me just say Terrence ended up in a in a in a position where he didn't agree with some of these interests who I just described and then sure let's throw it over to him yeah because initially from what I understand Terrence they were coming to you right and they were started giving you awards and inviting you to fancy dinners and having you speak and you were even on the parole board and and you know they were you know they were really they wanted you to be their guy in a way right but at a certain point it seems like were you too independent for them were you too you know what happened why why did why did why and how did you know these big interests that we're talking about how how did that impact you what was your experience of that tell us a little bit about that I mean, frankly, I'll just say, I think that they thought I was a more sanitized type of black man, if that makes sense to you. Yeah. To where, um, you know, and, and note this, because we, we need intellectuals. We, we, everybody can't be an ex-gang member, right? Like, you, you know, not every black man, you know, has been in the gang, is from the ghetto, or has this, it survived this. And even if they have, that doesn't mean that they have to have these, these rough tendencies. But I do think that they thought I was not going to be protesting police brutality or racism. I don't think they thought that I would, you know, be the type of person I am around these pro-social issues. And I think that they thought I was going to play the game. And, and I have to admit for a few years I was because I was fresh out of prison. Mind you, I was working at Einstein Bagels. And, you know, I went from Einstein Bagels to being part-time with Prodigal Son and part-time with the Denver Children's Home, which is the oldest nonprofit in, in Colorado. It was called the Denver Orphanage. So uh, I was able to learn. We did things with Oprah Winfrey. Um, they had a huge amount of money and they taught me and they, they let me grow Prodigal Son from working with them. You know, so before I went full time with Prodigal Son, uh, I, I wasn't that green, but I was still, I only had about three years under my belt of working with nonprofit work. Uh, and then I had my full board of directors and we were writing our own grants and we had our own mission. So I needed the money because if you're in the red with a nonprofit, even though it's a nonprofit, if you're in the red, the IRS, they will take your 501c3 designation, right? You, you have to have community support. That's, that's part of the reason why you have a 501c3 is to do work for the community that the government cannot do. That's why people get tax write-offs. So uh, I had to stay in the black. I had to make money. I had to make sure not only was I fulfilling my mission, but paying myself. I had a family right? I had to pay my bills, like, you know, journalism or community work. It's not free. It's work. It takes hours. You know, I can't do 10 hours a day doing this for free. Then I can't pay my bills. Like, you know, so, um, so I had to make these connections with these, these foundations and with the city. And initially I wasn't protesting police violence. I have to admit, even though I have been to prison, I'm this ex-gang member, this young African-American, 
I, I didn't understand the totality of police violence and, and just, just policing in America. There was a lot of things about politics that I had to grow to learn over the 16 years I've been out of prison. You know, so um, I didn't fully understand it. I just wanted to run my after school program. I started with 11 kids. I started Tuesdays and Thursdays. Then it ballooned to 22 kids. Then it was 33 kids. Then it was 50 kids. And I had to be there every day after school. And then it's like I had to leave the Denver Children's Home to, to not only be there every day, but I had to prepare to be there for 50 kids every day. So that was my full-time job. You know, so now I'm keyed in. I need the grant money. I'm part of the system. I'm part of this. Uh, can I say the word titty? Like, you know, no disrespect. Yeah. But like I'm part of the, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm drinking the milk. I need the milk to stay nourished to, for survival. So once I started um, protesting police brutality, uh, we started with Trayvon Martin. I started with conversations with what happened around the homicide in the Holly when I was still in, um, incarcerated with a, this a mentally disabled young man named Paul Childs. He was killed right around the corner from the Holly. The police shot him three times and his mother had actually called them to help with him. He was having a mental episode. They came to her house and murdered him. So um, I was part of those conversations in the, when I fell out with the police when they seen me protesting uh, for Trayvon Martin and then uh, Mike Brown. The police, they just literally, I haven't won a, a, a certificate since then, since 2012. I won probably dozens and dozens of awards uh, before me and law enforcement here locally started having issues. And um, since my first march for Trayvon Martin, I literally have not received a certificate from any foundations, which I don't need any of that stuff. That's not what I do it for, but um, you sure. know, in the city of Denver, um, I'm gonna make the statement, law enforcement runs our media. They run, literally our foundations are keyed in with them with award ceremonies, the work, um, our developers, everything in Denver, I think is ran around the Denver Police Department. And so once Joe, they said I wasn't cool, I wasn't cool anymore. I was, I was out. Yeah, indeed. Um, and that's, of course, what led to this incident, right? I don't want to give too much away uh, um, because we want people to buy the book, right? Um, to, to really find out what happens. But, but like Julian was saying, it's not a whodunit, it's a why did all this happen, right? So, so that's the context. You're, you're running this nonprofit, but you're also, you haven't lost your conscience, right? When you see the police committing those, those acts, you, you're going to protest. And that means that they're not going to, like you're saying, they're not giving you that money, those awards or, or those things anymore. So Julian, as, as you were researching all this, okay. you know, what, what, what led to this? What led to the shooting? How, how did, yeah, how did we... Well, yeah, I mean, so I, 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 picking up from that, I would just say that what's interesting, though, because and Terrence has emerged even in the last year, as you know, he's been a very important protest figure and was charged with felonies for protesting. <laughs> That's a whole other part of the story, and it's in the epilogue of the book, of course. But uh, anyway, um, that that what was going on though was not only did Terrence need these organizations, but then he ultimately took a money from a Project Safe Neighborhoods grant, a federal grant. This is the premier anti-gang and anti-gun uh, 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 program or in effort in, in the country. And Denver has gotten a lot of money from it. Terrence ended up taking this grant. He ended up at odds with the police over how to run things. And so not only what, and, and, and at the same time was starting to be at odds with the developers over what was going on at Holly Square and how they were handling this redevelopment and who was involved, which was no one from the neighborhood and it didn't see many people of color. <clears throat> so, um, and he's basically the, the community representative of this project. He was the founder and president of this Holly Area Redevelopment Project, which was a community uh, effort to discuss what they wanted and they weren't being listened to. Um, he resigned from that. At the same time, this there was an undercover operation going on at the Holly leading up to the six months before the um, opening of this new Boys and Girls Club. And um, he not only was concerned has been as an activist been you know focused on these overt acts of police you know uh misconduct but um also he was dealing straight on with a lot of the issues that are beneath the surface 
of these kinds of things. And that includes um, the misuse of informants in neighborhoods and what they're actually up to. And this became at the time leading up to the shooting, there was a lot of tension on the block around who's an informant and what's going on. And in fact, there was uh, an, an effort going on under, in an undercover or effort going on at that time that employed blood gang informants from the neighborhood. So there was this contributed significantly to the tension that was going on before the shooting took place. So Terrence, is that right? I mean, it, you know, basically, you know, and to be an informant, to be a snitch or a rat is the worst thing that can that anyone can be, right? I mean, to even be called that or have people think that, even if it's not true, uh, people got killed for that or, 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 you know, all kinds of things happen, right? Tell, tell us a little bit about that whole thing and how, how that has worked in, in your experience as a former, you know, as a former gangster, but also as someone now who, who was an activist. So, uh, you know, I'm gonna make a statement about like this whole thing about snitching and being a rat. Yeah. If you're a journalist or just a normal college student or a person walking through Brooklyn and you see some gang members in New York gun somebody down and you go to court, no, no one's calling you a snitch unless they're, they're dumbest, most evil, ignorant gang members around. Even gang members will get mad at another gang member and say, well, you're dumb, man. Why would you do it in front of a in front of Alan Chin and these guys, like they're, right. they're citizens, like you did something very dumb, like that's not snitching, no, no, no. If you are an active gang member, okay, it, it, where murders are happening, okay, like, you know, uh, there, there's there's drugs being sold, there, there, there's sex trafficking going on, there's, there's a little bit of everything. Once you have a viable street gang, there's no one leader, you can't control other street gangs will make fun of your street gang if you are not doing these things. Okay, so if you're an active gang member. Not everyone is involved with sex trafficking or drugs or this, but all gangs are involved with something. You can't work for the police department. And what ended up happening was when I didn't want to play ball, like when I didn't want to do word on the street meetings with law enforcement around the table, you know, because I'm a community activist. If you are a revolutionary or if you are a gang, anything that is fighting against law enforcement, if you're a gang member, then of course, you're a criminal. <laughs> you're not saint. You're, you're gangster. You're, gangsters proudly kill people, right? That's, they, they have their guns, they take pictures. So, and if you're a revolutionary, we're, we're fighting against police brutality, we're passing laws. You know, I'm not an anarchist, but I'm definitely here for better policing. I think that policing started from racism. And right now, from where we started to where we are now, it's still a racist, um, it's a racist culture, you know, so um, that's a part of many different organizations. So when I didn't want to, you know, have these meetings and when they felt like I was an activist, I was against policing and, and they decided they didn't like me, they had active gang members who were at the time informants for the police for drug deals, homicides, getting pistols off the streets. But since these guys were, now they're like around 50 years old. These guys were in their mid forties at the time. They, they didn't want to just do drug and gun deals. They said, well, if Terrence doesn't want to do it, we already have a problem with him for being the gang dropout anyways. Um, we'll do it. We, we, want to, we want to do things differently. We would like to be activists. We would like to be in his position. I don't like to say when someone's jealous of me or anything, if that's not true. I'm not, you know, I'm not the, I'm not all that, right? But I do think those guys were jealous. Um, they, they've, they've had other people who've listened to them, admitted to Julian, um, and they said it out their own mouths. There was jealousy there for my media attention. People thought I had more money than I had. Um, I was getting a small salary because I, that was my full time job. But I was not getting rich. I could not pay my bills. I, I could barely pay my bills, take care of my family, and have a hundred dollars, a couple hundred dollars at the end of the month, just like any other. I paid my taxes, it was my full-time job. Um, and I think those guys were thinking I was getting hundreds of thousands of dollars. I think those guys wanted media attention and they just wanted to make something of their lives while also being active gang members and getting paid by the police. And um, when I said I didn't wanna do some of the things and I had my attitude about it, the police were like, we don't care if he doesn't wanna do it. We have these OG bloods or his big homies, and we have these Crips and these other guys who are tougher than him. 
and they'll push them out. And when they started putting that plan in motion, it started leading to them getting the younger guys involved. And once those guys get involved, it just got out of control. You can't control what happens after that. They're gang members, you know? So yeah, it, 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 it seems to me like those guys were able to play both sides, right? They were still active gang members. So they're still making money from, from like you're saying, criminal uh, activity, whatever it is, right? But at the same time, they're getting money also now from the police and, and, and from, you know, the Safe Streets program and, and um, you know, all these other things, right? Like they're, they're, they're actually they're getting it both ways. And it seems to me that that is, isn't that kind of the definition of police corruption in a way, right? Well, I mean, the thing is that what I saw for sure is, you know, after this shooting, Terrence was replaced by literally a group of four active gang members who moved into his office. And I guess, you know, the city managed to pretend they thought they weren't active gang members or something, I don't know, but the results were absolutely disastrous. The violence spiked and it has continued to go up every year as, as more and more money has come in. And it's just, it, right now, actually, thankfully, the book has been putting some pressure on the city of Denver, and there's been some stories about that. Um, and maybe this is going to come to an end, but uh, it, it, it certainly is, is, is a series of events or a sequence of things and a combination of things that makes one wonder whether or not the goal of law enforcement is to eliminate gang violence, which they've said they were gonna do for 30 or 40 years now, and it's just kept going. Uh, as, as I think most of us know, in most cities, it's getting worse over the last couple of years, Denver's among them. Uh, a couple of cities that have had some, doing some interesting experimentation with more of street, you know, separating law enforcement funding from other more social services funding and cutting those things out of the police budgets. As we know, police end up getting calls and doing things that, that are all kinds of things that are not really in their purview. Um, and maybe better handled in another place with different goals. Um, Newark, Los Angeles uh, are actually having some success. And these are efforts that Terrence was doing. I mean, these were things that he, he, he basically, he ultimately like did a deal with the devil, took this law enforcement funded grant. And anyway, it ended him up with him facing life in prison at trial. And of course that story is all told in the book. Um, so yeah, um, Terrence, you want to pick up on that? And I want to kind of tie it in. We have a couple of questions here from our audience, which is, uh, you know, to, to bring, and I think you were mentioning it too, with the killings of, of um, you know, people like Breonna Taylor or, or um, of course, George Floyd. And uh, it is now exactly one year since uh, George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis. How, how do we bring this forward, right? You know, we have a corrupt police department that is, paying active gang members and it's all like julian was just saying you know it's 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 not working you have um a, a system where obviously clearly the way that police operate in in, in our cities is, is racist and is is just overly violent right like forget i mean not forget but in addition to you know, people dying from crimes, people are dying from the police. We know that. And so, yeah, on, on this first anniversary of, of uh, George Floyd, this is a question from Tom Moore. You know, how how does that connect for you? Um, you know, so first, yes, we did have to take that grant um, for, for survival. You know, it's not easy running a 501c3 and you're an ex-gang member and you're in invisible Denver and you, you know, you have to raise hundreds of thousands and $50 pops is not going to get it. Right. So for sure, $10,000 grants, $25,000 grants, you need $50,000 grants. You need to pay salaries. You need to, I had to buy playgrounds, do maintenance, all kinds of things. And once I received the money, they felt I had an obligation to play by the rules uh, because I was receiving their money. It's their money. You know, it's, it's, it's law enforcement money and law enforcement is at the table. And when I refused to do word on the street meetings, um, it got really nasty. Um, it got really bad. Uh, we, we pretty much had a separation of ideologies. That's where we kind of figured out that we, we are not, just, we don't have the same mentality around policing um, and community safety. And uh, even though they, I was under contract to receive the money still, um, I was not playing ball. 
And, and so that's kind of, you know, where that goes with that. Now, as far as the, the anniversary of George Floyd, um, you know, being killed, where do, you know, where do we go with policing? You know, one thing you have to do, why, why is lobbying so big in Washington? Because in order to make people act right, sometimes you've got to pass laws. That's why who the president is is so important, right? That's why certain people want Biden to be president, certain people want Trump to still be president, because that's power. Like, policy is power. Once you pass a law, the police will enforce it by gun. Whether they like the law or not, they will say, I don't even like the law, but right now I'm getting paid and I'm getting overtime. I'm going to need you to step. I need you to put your hands up. You're breaking this law. I don't like it, but I have my gun and you need to put your hands behind your back. So once something becomes law, whether it's racist, whether it's to protect Blacks, Asians, whatever, it's enforceable. That's why we need laws. And um, that goes for the police, too. You know, the people who enforce the law, obviously, we need to put laws around their behavior and activities the same way they enforce the society's behavior and activities. So like in Colorado, um, we wrote portions of it literally in my apartment, and we got the law passed Senate Bill 217, um, which were we were the first state to pass comprehensive um, policing reforms around, um, you know, the, the use of the, the, you know, banning the illegal chokehold. We can sue the police or the police department. Uh, you know, a police officer's partner cannot watch their partner murder someone like we've seen with the George Floyd incident. You know, so those types of things. And I think New York City was actually the first city to pass these types of um, policing um, overhauls through a municipal law. So, you know, those are the types of things we're doing right now. Since George Floyd has been killed, we, we've passed um, national laws around policing that has that have never been passed. And it, 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 today is the anniversary of these laws. We got our law passed Juneteenth, actually, you know, uh, last year. Here, let me show a couple... Alan, we talked. So here, uh, some people probably don't know, Terrence became the literal face of the Elijah McClain, Justice for Elijah McClain movement. Here he is uh, on the day that Colorado became the first state in the nation to pass significant police reform following George Floyd. Um, he, uh, these are photos from the book actually, but um, the, uh, the, he was recently, well, in the last year, he was arrested for his for his leading of these protests and charged with inciting a riot and other charges, a few other protest leaders were also arrested. Uh, anyway, they finally dropped all the felony charges only a couple weeks ago. But this is what's crazy is it's a cliche almost that a writer misses a book deadline. <laughs> but um, thankfully, I did miss my book deadline because if this book would have come out two years earlier, the epilogue would not be packed with the most unbelievable storyline of Terrence who has already gone through all of what you know because the climax of the sort of heart of the book is him facing life in prison in 2015 but you know the or the beginning of the book starts in 1955 and I mean most of it, it gets pretty into the 80s like he's born in chapter three but or in the 70s but uh but you know all of that happened and this is underlines to me it ended up underlining and making for me this book so much about you know activism and thwarted activism over the years and decades of course in denver but really on a national in a national prism and that one of the things that several people have remarked is not very well covered previously is the real connection between the you know, the, the civil rights movement, the, the, the figures that emerged in it and their connections to gangs. And then the, the, when, when the civil rights movement and many of those leaders like the Panthers were eliminated, the rise of street gangs. And let's remember that, you know, in 2010, when Terrence's camo movement was at its peak, the FBI moved a huge regional headquarters into Denver and was illegally spying on activists at Occupy Denver. So here also, it, their headquarters was about walking distance by maybe five minutes from Holly Square in this new development across the, the, the road there. So this, um, 
And, and, and I just mean that he was, you know, I, yeah. I think his activism was clearly noticed and not appreciated in important circles that were ultimately, you know, involved with what he was doing. I want to pick up on that point here. It's actually in my list of, of questions here. Um, and, and I want to ask Terrence this, right? Um, so the first entire third of the book, Act One, it's a book in three acts, which is, uh, you know, um, and is all about the history, actually, which which Julian has talked a little bit about already, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, the civil rights movement. And Terrence, I, I want to ask you this, right? So you grew up, I mean, you. it sounds like, obviously, I know this only from reading Julian's book, but it sounds like you have um, a, a pretty, or a, a, your grandmother ran a restaurant, pretty amazing. Your dad, who um, Julian was reading, I don't know if you were on, the, on this um, Zoom yet, um, your dad has been this amazing preacher and, and um, funeral person. Um, your mom, who's a little bit less, but also, you know, ended up running um, successful business. Um, but they also had very hard times, right? Along part of that, you know, there were, there were many times when they were not so successful and, and, you know, because of not having enough money, because of not having enough opportunity, not being able to get, jobs. And so I kind of want to ask you, you know, when you were growing up as a, as a kid, as a child, as a young man, you know, what, what, what was your thought around all this, right? Because we talk about gangs and, and we talk about, you know, guns and all these things we're talking about, but let's be honest, right? If, if this was a group of white guys in a poor neighborhood somewhere, nobody calls them a gang hardly. It's just, you know, it's just the, uh, right. You know, white guys with guns, no one thinks that's scary. That's like, you know, everybody's right. You know, that's why everyone goes around with open carry. So so tell me a little bit about how you thought about all that growing up. Um, so first I'm going to say there are some scary white gangs, actually, because gang violence really comes from poverty. Right. And, you know, even though we do talk about the poverty of black and brown people a lot, but actually there's a lot of poor white people in America, too. Right. Um, yep. And, you know, we, we have the Hells Angels, we have Mongols, we have skinhead groups, we have Aryan Brotherhood groups, um, we have a lot of different white gangs too, but there is a different focus. We have Italian mob gangs in sure. New York. Old school. Italy is a, is a European country, right? Yeah. You know, so um, it's not just a black or brown thing, right? You know, so uh, it's a poverty thing, you know, so... Um, and we also have affluent gangs. We call them Illuminati's and we call them all these different, you know, we give them all these different, uh, you know, names, but those, those are just pro, those are just groups. I wouldn't call them pro-social. They're social groups. The, um, they're, sometimes they're negative peer groups, right? Like you can have a negative peer group around affluency too. Um, but when, when, you, when you're poor, when you're angry, when you're traumatized and you're a part of a group, it's called the gang. And, um, you know, what emanates from that is a lot of times violence, you know, that everybody doesn't have 20, 30, a hundred thousand dollars to say, well, we're a gang, but instead of killing someone, let's, let's take a trip, <laughs> you know, let's, <laughs> let's go see Allen in New York. Let's right. our gang, just go to New York. That, that's our gang activity, right? Right. You know, so, you know, growing up in Park Hill, uh, when crack cocaine hit, it, 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 is a, it is a small microcosm of the story of South Central Los Angeles. On a, on, a, on a much smaller scale, you know, uh, these things be felt them before us, but as these things went east, and I've seen um, a question by Mr. Moore asking about the difference between Denver gangs and, and, and New York gangs, right? Like, you know, we have the nine trade bloods from Takashi 69. They didn't start till 93. We had already had the summer of violence in Denver by the time 93 hit, right? So um, as crack cocaine came and as, as the tribalism and the different communities in Denver, which were black, Denver is not known for having lots of black people. But for the few black communities we had, there, there was definitely dividing lines. And, um, you know, the more people started just falling off into drug abuse and the more it wasn't just like this middle class black, uh, you know, blue collar community, the more it became where well, we're Crips over here and we're Bloods, you know, and we're selling dope over here, even though we're bloods and you're a blood, but we don't want to see you on that block. You can go over there. Once that kind of stuff started and uh, people started hurting each other and people's parents were using drugs and just it, it, Park Hill went from a, a, like almost the perfect middle-class black community in the, in the early 80s 
after they cleaned up some of the arson and stuff from the Dahlia. It, 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 my early childhood went from like almost a perfect African-American experience with the gang stuff we've seen just being fisticuffs and bottles. And it was almost like a movie. It was almost like Karate Kid, right? I did it, it got real serious. You know, people started getting shot, people started getting killed. You know, you're hearing, you're hearing Uzis going off in the middle of the night, in the middle of the day. Um, you know, we couldn't go to different communities. We were stuck in Park Hill and, um, you know, Park Hill uh, decayed. And that's, that's, that's how gang violence kind of but took it, off. It seemed like some of the Bloods and Crips and the other groups, they're in the same family, right? You, you have cousins who are on the other gang or you have, you know, or, or certainly even if they're not related, you grew up together. You went to the same, right? Fathers and sons. Fathers and sons. You'll have yeah. a crip father and a blood son. Yeah. You'll have a you'll have a blood brother and a crip brother who maybe had a separation yeah. um, because of the trauma, family trauma. And you know, someone with they live with the father, someone and they could be across the street. Uh, one street divides the Crips and Bloods in Denver. And it's I mean, it's been homicides around like don't you don't cross that middle divide. If we catch you across the middle of that street. We'll wreck our car into you. We will, we will kamikaze you because we told you already. All we have is our respect, like, right? This is invisible Denver. This is not, even in LA, you could be a famous gang member or in Chicago and their gang, member, their gang problem is worse than any other cities, right? Um, in Denver, you're not gonna become a famous gang member. Uh, all you have is your respect. So uh, in, gang violence got very intense, just as intense as it did in, in, in bigger cities. And um, yes, you know, you could be, you could, your best friend who was literally your best friend if they lived across Colorado Boulevard or in another area, it got so tribal to where, you know, you could literally see them with their friends and you could see them with yours and you can't even speak to them. Okay, we're running out of time, I think, but I wanna just, um, we have a, another couple of questions and I think I'll ask Julian this first, but I wanna ask you, Terrence, as well. And in a way, it's the same question, right? What's the top reporting war story you have from reporting? Or what was the most surprising twist or turn? And so for Julian, that's direct, you know, in your reporting. And for Terrence, that would be in your experience. And, and let's start with Julian, and then we'll take it to Terrence. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, in so Alan, obviously, you know, and I'm not sure about the question exactly. Alan has done a lot more sort of war reporting specific stuff. This was actually, I mean, I've done some stuff where I actually felt in danger on various uh, reporting trips I've had. It, it wasn't a, exactly a war, various things that I've, you know, written about in Brazil with this Indian um, chief who was murdering his own, you know, uh, members of his reservation and and it was a and, and at one point I was told that he because I had learned too too much and anyway I've been in a few situations what went up where I was trying like okay my flight's in a couple of days like I just got to get the hell out of here what was interesting and challenging about this was I didn't expect to find myself in my hometown of Denver to hear about a hit a paid hit put on someone that I was close to with closely connected to and that if there was such a hit it was very clear why because this person was vocally saying things that were very sensitive at a time of a lot of corruption when that corruption had not really risen to the public full view not to media but i definitely knew about it and everyone knew i knew about it and this particular person didn't want me to go to the authorities or anything he in fact laughed it off and said he wasn't worried about this, although admitted, he, he said there'd been hits on him before, although he admitted never paid once. <laughs> so now there's money on it. Uh, so here I am finding myself more afraid to go to the police in Denver over a situation I'm in than not. And that was a surprise to be in and a sadness and a disillusionment, you know? And, and, and so there was a lot of strange things that I encountered because of how deep I did end up getting into this story. And it was because of that, that it was able to really tell the ins and outs and some significant plot twists that do happen along the way that re ultimately reveal what did happen, you know, that day and how the city was going about fighting gang violence, which was problematic to say the least. And how about you, Terrence? And so the question I'd, I'd, I'd phrase it this way, You've had this incredible life with a lot of ups and downs and, and surprises, but what, what was the most surprising thing 
for you of all? You know, was it was it not being a gang member anymore? Was it becoming an activist or a revolutionary? Uh, you know, what was the one moment that really, you know, that you remember as like, wow, this is this is one of these important moments of my life? Um, I wish, you know, there's a lot of positive moments, you know, right? Like me going rafting and hiking and all these different things as an ex game member I wasn't doing and I grew up in, right in Northeast Denver. Um, but, you know, I think this, the surprise, the most surprising thing is I have to say is, is not that positive. It's me being very naive to the world. Um, me thinking I was gonna get out of prison and say I'm, I'm done with gang banging and, and wear a collar shirt and work with kids thinking that I would not become a target of law enforcement and gang members who I grew up with working for them. Um, I really thought that if I left the gangs alone, like they were telling me to, hey man, leave the gangs. Do for your community, be, become a, 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 you know, become like a Black Panther, be, be, become like a, you know, like a Huey Newton, become like a Malcolm X. Where's Malcolm? All these Black people wear Malcolm X shirts and Tupac shirts. Um, I, I naively thought that if I, exuded that type of leadership and that type of energy that I would be better received and that people would cheer me on and be like, look at this young man go. Uh, and the more I, I tried to, you know, really be sincere for my community and really kind of hold down what a revolutionary should be saying and doing for the community and not for grant money or, or to appease others, um, the more I was surprisingly pushed out, <laughs> even by my own people who were either afraid or connected to these sources because they needed the money. And yeah that $3,500 and not to do 10 years in federal prison because they're a grandfather now. And this has just been honest. And that, it, it damaged me and it, it, it confused me. And it, you know, I felt gaslit. Like, I, I felt like it's like, I'm doing the right things, but it's like, I'm perceived to be an angry black man. I'm or an angry activist. I'm angry about the right things, but I'm not overly angry. I'm not out of control, right? And that was the biggest surprise to me was thinking that me changing my life and leaving the gangs would be a good thing for some people when it almost got me killed. I, I had to defend my life as we know. Thank you. I think, unfortunately, we kind of have to end it here. But Terrence, thank you for, for, for that. Julian, um, uh, uh, you know, really, really great insights and dedication on this project. And I encourage everyone, you know, if, if you like what you heard tonight, please buy the book because you will... Um, really get and especially in a, in a conversation like this we can't get too deep into some of the details of and the history which is um you know which the book does get into and and really these questions um you know i'll end with this idea it's not original to me but my friend in 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 detroit talks about the porch and the corner right um you know you can go up on the, on, on on a street that's tough where there's a lot of violence or or or, and trauma on and you can be on the corner where you're in trouble or you can be on the porch kind of part of the street but not not in it and i think terrence is somebody who's really been both right at different times in your life and and julian has um really spent seven years uh on the street on that street in a way metaphorically so thank you guys both um and thank you to Greenlight for hosting this and please buy the book i I have to tell you, I could not put it down. And, you know, and, and Julian asked me to do this. And I said yes before I realized, oh, wait a minute. If I have to interview him about his book, that means I have to read it. And um, I, but once I started, I literally did not put it down. And it's not a small book, right? It's, it's 300, however many pages, but you will not put it down. Thank you guys all. Thank you, Alan. Thanks, Greenlight, Chelsea, Terrence. Yeah, Appreciate thank you so much, Julian and Alan and Terrence for tonight's fantastic conversation. And thank you to everyone who came out virtually tonight and joined us and shared this space for conversation and connection. A reminder again that you can buy The Holly at Greenlight. Uh, if you're local to Brooklyn, we're open for limited capacity shopping noon to 7 p.m. every day or you can find the book by link in the chat and shop at greenlightbookstore.com for either a local in-store pickup or for shipping anywhere in the US. Thank you so much again, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Good night. Great. Thank you. All. Thank you.